I would love to start by introducing everybody. This is going to be our 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 first happy hour in 2022. Very excited about it. Um, between the the holidays and everything, it was it's it's nice to get everybody back together. Um, everyone's been you know making cocktails, and we've been it's been really busy in the group, but it's nice to uh, to finally be uh, back doing a happy hour and. And one that's um, a box that everyone's been excited about for a while, which is our, you know, our quote unquote toddy, back, toddy box, which is our Waddle of whiskey box. Because um, we have hot and cold, and then we have uh, three different, completely different styles of whiskey. And uh, luckily, we have three Not wonderful good. and skilled gentlemen here to talk about them. So first, we have, I can't even point to you because everybody, <laughs> everyone has a different grid. But further over here, I have uh, Gareth Howells, who's the North American Bacardi Single Malts Ambassador. You can, there we go, get a wave for everybody. Um, we also have Matt Connor, who's the Massachusetts Aberfeldy Brand Ambassador. You can give a wave to everyone. There we go. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Teeling. What am I talking about? Teeling. <laughs> Teeling. Great, perfect. Um, I mean, since we're mix and matching whiskey anyway, sure. So, uh, and then, of course, we have uh, Nicholas Nick Hogan, who is the Angels Envy Whiskey Guardian, um, who's waving to you right now, and is also uh, the founder of Mover and Shaker Company, which um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with. And if not, once we dive into making cocktails, I'm going to totally pimp them out. So that'll be fun. So first and foremost, if anyone has any questions during the Zoom, please make sure that you post in the chat so that uh, someone on the Shaker and Spoon team can see it and we can relay it to the guests when it comes time for Q&A. But at the end of every section, if you've not been with us before, we'll take a little break for, for Q&A so that we can like review anything or if you have questions, this is a great time to be able to get to our guests directly. Um, we're gonna start off with Gareth. This is um, a section that we're calling Tati Mikshmati. Um, and Cause I wanna talk to Gareth about the origins of, like the early origins of the toddy and how it was a cocktail before even cocktails were cocktails. But if we were to look at the history of the toddy, we're kind of going back to the 1600s, mid 1600s and British controlled India. <clears throat> but back then it wasn't a toddy, it was known as a taddy, which was actually a drink that was made from fermented palm sap. As we kind of like move further down timelines, it was round about the late 1700s that the toddy got more, more defined, or it was clarified in terms of its definition. And it began to be described as a drink that involved uh, alcoholic liquor, of course, uh, hot water, sugar, and spice. Now, if you think about the origins of where the taddy first came from, which is India, it makes perfect sense that spice is gonna be involved when you start understanding the historical spice trade that existed, but also the Brits, and look, I know I am a Brit, <clears throat> but I'm also half Irish. And I know that makes no sense because I now represent Scotch whiskey, but we're kind of all interrelated one way or another. But when you think about how terrible the Brits were in terms of their colonial activities, it makes perfect sense that they would take something, kind of change it more for their palate and their climate. So this is really where the hot comes in and then kind of bring it back to the United Kingdom and English shores. Now, it was around about the mid 1900s. Um, so kind of like thing, I think it was around about 1850, there or thereabouts. The first kind of definition of a toddy was published, but it was published really as a prescribed medicinal cure. Now, if you think about what a toddy is, right? As we understand it, and by then the definition had changed slightly because there was the addition of citrus. You had booze, which to be fair, cures pretty much everything, especially if it's whiskey related. You got citrus, so you've got a good old dose of vitamin C. You've got spice, which has a tendency, especially with the right spices, to be highly medicinal in nature. And then with the addition of hot water and then sugar or a sugar substitute as a sweetener, you've got something that's not only palatable, but quite believably back in those times could do you more good than harm. Uh, from my understanding, it was actually even prescribed to children. Um, now, I mean, to be fair, 100% fair, my mum told me that she used to have a nip of babies before she fed 
my, myself and my little brother to put us to bed to make sure that we slept. Now, we weren't terrible children, and I don't know how many other mothers may or may not have done that, but it certainly didn't do us any harm. And as a generation, and a generation after that, and a generation after that survived, I mean, it can't have been a completely terrible thing, but still, not 100% sure in the mm -hmm. medical science with this. But roughly, there or thereabouts speaking, that's where we are. With the toddy, it's something. And again, we're looking at kind of like mid-1700s in India that somehow found its way to become. I mean, I wouldn't even call this a modern classic. I would call this a classic cure-all beverage that quite frankly doesn't even have to be drunk hot anymore. There's so many different iterations. And I think as you go through the box, you look at the recipes that the bartenders have created for us, you're gonna see that there's a whole depth and breadth to not only this drink, but this drinking category that is quite sublime and is equally delicious. You're coming to this discussion, not only having been a bartender for a long time, but also now being in charge of the single malts for the entire portfolio. And uh, one of the things I want to ask you is, you know, what kind of whiskey was used originally with toddies or was it not even whiskey? Well, I mean, this is the really interesting thing. Back then, when you think about the armed forces of the United Kingdom, there were regiments that came from every part of the, uh, of the country, whether you were looking at the, uh, the, the, the Royal Scots, the Welsh Fusiliers, whether you were looking at regiments that came from Ireland and Northern Ireland as well. So when the, the fighting forces came back, and they were the predominant force who were out in India at the time, and kind of spread knowledge of, of this drink or this style of drinking, it went to all four corners of the United Kingdom. Now, again, when you start looking at those time frames, there was two predominant whiskies that were really at the fore. And that was, of course, Irish and Scottish. I think it would be very, very hard to define which whiskey originally would have been the whiskey that people would have enjoyed within that toddy. But I think it would be safe to say that both styles and types of whiskey would have been enjoyed in equal measure. Although I would point out, though, that the way that whiskey was drunk back then is not the way that we understand the world of whether it be Irish or Scotch whiskies nowadays. It would have been effectively drunk as, as new make spirit. More often than not, probably quite hot, robust, oily and somewhat obnoxious whiskey because our current understanding of how well spirits are aged nowadays, especially in, in line with the SWA rules, when I talk specifically about Scotch whiskey that apply, they weren't, they weren't in place back then. More often than not, it probably would have been illicit distillate that would have been drunk and added to hot water, sugar and spice, um, especially in and around the space side and highland regions of Scotland. But I think it'd be very hard to distinguish which whiskey would have been put in a hot toddy first when it came back to the shores of the United Kingdom. So do you think that it was more of, of like a, the cover up aspect like we this is product that is not meant to be had by itself because it was pretty rough and that's where you know this particular style of serving the drink came from i think the style of serving the drink came from the indian shores originally and then gradually made its way through the united kingdom i don't think it was a way necessarily to describe what we would consider to be quite a rough spirit uh, because back then it was drunk neat regardless i mean that was just what whiskey or that was just what distillate was to them they didn't have an understanding of how we drink now so i think palates change over time uh, and certainly back then it just would have been a way especially if you're in scotland wearing a kilt and from my understanding with that and the undercrackers you're probably going to want something that's going to ward off the breeze somewhat and, uh, and mixing booze with some hot water sugar and spice is probably going to be quite a conveniently brilliant way to, to warm the cockles as my grandmother would have said well said um we do have a really good question from mark um however at first, I want to pit you and Matt against one another in terms of um, Irish versus Scotch, uh, because of the fact that we really don't know the origins. One of what, Mark asked a question here that he'd always associated toddies with rum instead of whiskey, and so the first thing I thought of actually was the Teeling small batch, and I think it's one of the reasons why it does so well when introducing, like reintroducing people to Irish whiskey when all they've had is sort of like a well, um, you know, a triple distilled, uh, you know, column still Irish whiskey as opposed to like either a pot still or something cool like Teeling that is finished in rum casks, which is one of the things that, you know, makes it unique. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So I, I will say that I think from my research, at least, uh, it was kind of initially toddies were made with either generally whiskey or brandy, which is another, which was another common spirit at the time anyways. Um, but speaking of the rum cask, I think that the working with Teeling small batch in the toddy, it, the rum cask really brings out a lot of that like citrus flavor and a lot of the spicy notes, which is great. Um, and I know Gareth working with the, uh, cause I used to be on the single malt portfolio as well, uh, for, for Bacardi, um, working with Aberfeldy and Atati, it was phenomenal anyways, the honey, working with the honey and lemon, it really brings out those nice, rich characteristics of the Aberfeldy. So it's kind of funny when you do like a comparison sampling between two different types of toddies using Irish whiskey and scotch and how completely different they are, whether it be single malts or even if you were using like teeling single grain, for example, um, because the flavors are going to switch so much just based on the whiskey that you're using in general. Everything else could be the same exact ingredients, but the whiskey is going to really, really push it over the edge to, to the next level. Right. The recommendation that that um, we had from, uh, you know, our featured bartenders this month was the Teeling Small Batch, which I thought was, A, it's pretty accessible. Um, you can find it in a lot of places and, and also price wise. But what was really, um, what's really cool about it is also that that note that's so different, that rum finish, which people still don't really understand, and it works so nicely. It's it's almost like the um, uh, the you know a lot of people are doing the Caribbean casks now, right? Where they're doing single malt Scotch whiskeys, where they're doing a finish um, for you know a year or two in used rum cask, which is pretty cool. But as I was showing you before we started the call, I was using the single grain for my hot toddy because quite honestly I thought it worked so well I really wanted that high note um, for this particular cocktail um, and, and it also is is kind of like a better swap with or at least that I found with a single malt scotch whiskey in terms of you know what came first the chicken or the egg is it you know <laughs> is it mick schmati or mac schmati is it irish or or, or scotch that's kind of the fun thing about the what will it be whiskey box is that we can try them both you know there's enough ingredients to make four drinks i can try it four different times hot and cold and with the different whiskeys so um in terms of matt when you when you're first introducing um an irish toddy to people do, are, do they seem like confused by it are they into it like what's your reaction that you get um honestly i think that it depends on who i'm talking to really because some people automatically go irish with their toddies um i know i like I, I, we call them hot whiskeys in well i'm not from ireland but um in ireland they call them hot whiskeys uh so it's it's kind of the style of the toddy that you're making uh like i said before where you can either go scotch or irish um i've even seen in the united states people use bourbon all the time in them. And I think it really depends on what the, if you're going out to like a bar or a restaurant, it really depends on what the bar manager or the bartender's kind of palate decides which way they wanna go with it. The bar that I used to work at, we always used to use uh, bourbon and we've switched it up over the years to, to kind of try different things. And there's tons of different riffs that we've made on toddies in general, just because I live in New England and it's cold here, you know, 99% of the time. And if it's not cold, it's raining. So, um, so yeah, it's you know it's one of those things where I think it, it's really up to your palate and what you like, and that that's the fun thing about this box is being able to switch it up with whatever you want to. If you have all three ingredients, you can kind of just plug and play with which ones that you want to, and you you basically have that that list of cocktails to make. But it's always fun to kind of do your own thing, you know, mixing ingredients, mixing up the cocktails, making your own riffs on things. That's pretty much the best thing about being a bartender in general, I feel like. And, and at the end of the day. Um... You know, a, a tot, like your know, basic toddy structure is very simple, right? You have your base spirit, your lemon, your honey, which is basically, again, you know, um, a citrus and a sweetener. Uh, and then whether or not you want to do it hot or cold, so you can al always add your hot water. Uh, you know, you can do pretty much any sweetener and you can do any citrus and, and it's, you can mix and match them to, based on which spirit you're using, what direction you want to go and then you know with this particular box we do have people all over um you know the southeast where it's still pretty warm and they don't necessarily want to put boiling water or another cocktail but 
we'll get more into that with uh, with Nick later. One more question for Gareth. Um, do you think Robert Burns ever enjoyed Atari? Um, right, really interesting question. So, of course, next Tuesday, for those who didn't know, 25th of January, it is Burns Night, a globally recognized celebration of uh, basically the poet laureate, the son of Scotland, Robert Burns. Now, he was born on January 25th, but he was born in 1759. Now, Matthew can correct me on this, but the kind of popularity or really the records of the toddy within the United Kingdom didn't start coming around to kind of like the early to mid 1800s. So there is always the possibility that there was a crossover because, of course, you know, written records are not necessarily, you know, well, it's not definitive proof as to whether things did or did not exist. Now, I would definitely like to think that he did, because there's many things that you can talk about with Robert Burns. You can talk about his poetry, you can talk about his songs, you can talk about his romantic love for life, but he was also somewhat of a hard drinking womanizer. There's a very secret side to, to Robert Burns that many people don't know. Not only that, probably quite controversially, he ended up working for the government as what was known as the gauger, working for uh, tax and excise, effectively collecting revenues from distillers illicit and otherwise in Scotland, which probably should have made him one of the more hated people within Scotland, but yet he's revered with a, with a love that resounds today. I mean, unfortunately he died when he was only 37 years old. So if we assume that the toddy was in and around the Highland region and Speyside region of Scotland ran about the late 1700s, and I'm fairly sure he would have tried a hot toddy or a variation thereof. So I'm just going to say, yeah, I, I need to think, I want to think, I would love to think. We have to believe. Had a toddy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Matt, next time you want to complain about the weather in the Northeast, think about the weather in Scotland and how they're probably never having a cold toddy. <laughs> <laughs> they're most likely always making it the hot version. Um, one of the things that, like, you know, that people don't know um, about him is that he actually wrote Auld Lang Syne. Like, you know, he, he's known for his poetry, but he, he wrote this song that everyone knows from, from New Year's. And so, which is funny because it's very much him. It's very much sentimental yet celebratory. It's a time where like everyone's going to smooch, which also fits <laughs> also fits his mo but um how do people celebrate burns night in in general um so generally it, it can be quite convoluted so what i'm going to do is i'm going to try and break it down into as few parts as possible they get smashed on whiskey they drink a lot of whiskey for a start they then recite they celebrate his life uh, effectively by reciting his poetry uh, also singing his songs but most traditionally associated with Burns Night is a traditional haggis dinner. Um, does anyone want me to kind of go into the nuts and bolts of what haggis is or should I just leave haggis round about there? <laughs> and it would, be served, it would be served with neeps and tatties if you were in Scotland. It would normally be started with something like a cockaliki soup, a cullen skunk which is this really beautiful Scottish broth-like dish that involves heavy cream and smoked white haddock and potatoes and vegetables. I mean, it really is quite delectable. In fact, Donnie, from memory, that's what we had at the Cregella Key Hotel that time that we were in Scotland together. Yeah, we did. Uh, it was quite delectable. I actually just found my, um, that, um, the little flask, the little round flask. Oh, that trip. Nice. I, was, yeah. I was hoping that we could actually toast with it. And then I opened it. I'm like, oh, this is so empty there's nothing left in there <laughs> but yeah burns, burns night is is um i've probably been to celebrations in multiple cities over the years and you're always going to have someone show up um with a kilt if not an entire group of people people are drinking whiskey they're going to have a ceremonial haggis people also have a ceremonial bite and then wash that down with whiskey i personally i'm a fan which i know is odd but they can be pretty tasty you for, we forgot the bagpipers, because in, in true tradition, you would pipe the haggis into the room. You would also pipe the guests to the dinner table as well. Or you can parade the haggis, as uh, Liesl posted. She wrote the, the parade of the haggis. Always <laughs> a good that. time. Yeah, that's always a good time. Um, 
if, are there any more uh, questions for regarding the toddy and like the history of the toddy from these two gentlemen? Because if not, we're going to move on to the next section and actually um, start having a beverage. So what I'd love to do now is I would love to um, to move to Nick Hogan, and he's one of our featured bartenders for the Wadalupe Whiskey Box. Um, he's based in Florida. He still has all 10 of his fingers, thankfully. Thankfully, good. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been with uh, the Angels Envy brand for uh, almost five years now, uh, bartending for about eight. Um, and I also run Mover and Shaker, which is like a, a lifestyle brand for bartenders, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to talk about this cocktail. Um, it is a little comical that I was chosen to do a toddy being from Florida, but I did do some time in uh, Colorado in the winters. So I drew a lot of inspiration from my time there um, and kind of used like some more artistic abstract thought behind this cocktail and, and the name and why I created it. Um, Rough Diamonds, a song by a Swedish singer. Um, and it, I was super into disco um, this past year and I really wanted to create this cocktail that it reminded me of my time in Colorado. Um, hence the ingredients, obviously. So you have rose hip, which is very floral, floral herbal tea. Um, we went with like a berry medley, uh, seasonal berries. Um, so blackberry, raspberry, um, and then obviously, you know, your whiskeys, um, and then a Douglas fir extract. So you think winter, you think skiing, snowy, snowy. Um, that's just what comes to mind to me. Um, and that's not a flavor you see too often in cocktails. Uh, you could maybe compare it somewhat to like juniper in a gin. Um, so it's a little, little different for a whiskey, but I think it's a really fun ingredient. And we found a really awesome way to use it with the, um, the extract. I've typically used, um, you can find a really nice tea on Amazon, a Douglas fir or a spruce tip tea. And I've done a lot of really fun syrups with that. Um, but for the sake of the so many ingredients and in, um, making that work with this cocktail, we decided to go with the extract there. Like what are some of the uh, examples of times like maybe Matt, uh, where you were somewhere and you wanted to like, it's definitely a toddy build of a cocktail, but there's sometimes when it's appropriate for hot and sometimes it's appropriate for cold. And I'm curious as to what are the kinds of conversations you maybe had with guests when you were behind the bar, um, choosing like, you know, between a hot toddy and, and a cold toddy. Was that for me? Sorry. Yes. Oh, right. um, <clears throat> yeah. So um, I think it depends on, I, I would consider a toddy, honestly, like a wintertime long drink, essentially, um, because you have the water element. It's kind of in a a bigger amount usually. Um, so it's like, I would usually replace it with like a, a highball or, so, or something like that. And it works really well in that regard. So usually when I'm talking to a guest, I would basically, I've made um, a, a Tom Collins is essentially a toddy, but cold, right? It's, you know, with soda water um, and gin, obviously, but you can obviously play with that those ingredients however you want to and i've i've always kind of directed a guest to you know have a conversation with me ask and we'll talk about like they'll say hey i really like toddies but it's 90 degrees outside which has happened maybe once ever up here but um <laughs> but i'll be like yeah that's great so let's make you a highball and we'll you know take it in the direction of a toddy so you have that spice element you also have that the citrus element and you have the soda water or you know whatever soda component we could Put in there so it could be tonic or whatever um but a toddy is basically it's to me it's very similar to that it's just a hot version of it so it's really easy to take a, a classic highball cocktail that you've had or riff on a highball cocktail that you've had and use those ingredients in a toddy as well got you occasionally um, it doesn't work i mean there have been times where you know like somebody calls for some random uh liqueur that do doesn't work super well like um Elixir Nova Solace, for example, I honestly can't figure out what I can even do with that stuff. But um, 
but yeah, it, for the most part, it's 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 all plug and play, and and uh, it's great to experiment that way, anyways. Because there's times when you'll try things and you'll be like, "Wow, I really don't like that," and you'll always remember to never make that cocktail again. That's the fun thing about R and D. Except I always have to drink my mistakes so that I definitely remember never to make those mistakes again. That's one rule. Um, by the <laughs> way, Nick, Nick, keep this in mind for future, you know, mover shaker reference is that drink your mistakes should be a t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that might be good. yeah. Or I mean like, or one of your cool like strainers, you can like there just you know. put it on there. So it's drink. Yeah. I have to drink my mistakes. I have a feeling um, I'm going to end up on one of his meme pages next. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> Holly asked a question. Do you think that a port cast finished single malt would work well in place of Angel's Envy, which she put in parentheses liquid gold. So <laughs> he's already a fan of Angel's Envy. Um, or do you think that it would be too overpowering? And uh, that's I, to all three of you, really. I love port-finished whiskey. There's just certain flavor profiles. And when we talk about a finish, we're talking about something that's happened after the initial maturation period. So it's effectively a way to nuance or introduce new flavor profiles that wouldn't have existed. So you still have that central body almost that that house style for the type the style and the producer of the whiskey but then you get those beautiful eloquent kind of full body notes that come through from the finish itself so <clears throat> i think it's a case of understanding what proof you like drinking your whiskey because when you look at port finishes within the world of scotch there's a whole range of different proofs that are there from 40 percent abv all the way up through cask strength so i would say choose wisely but for me a hundred percent this is going to work but it's going to work the same with a poor finished irish whiskey as it would with a poor finished american whiskey as well because the finish it's about nuance uh and so it's not going to be <clears throat> you're not talking about a, a whiskey that's been 100 percent maturated in port which would be a completely different story um matt is is the tealing um the tealing small batch the only one that has the um rum cask finish uh, so yeah, the, for our core line, yes, that's the only rum cask finished whiskey. We have one, we have our single malt hits five different wine casks, uh, Port Madeira, Cabernet Sauvignon, White Burgundy, and um, Oloroso Sherry. And then our, we release single casks all the time. Um, it just depends on if you're lucky enough to find one somewhere. And then we have two other whiskeys, but they, um, for the most part, are our lineup doesn't really incorporate one specific cask type except for um, our single grain and our um, small batch for the finish. Gotcha. The sing single grain, the one that you used, is exclusively aged in Cabernet Sauvignon barrels. Oh, I didn't know that. So this one, which is funny because it, it has a, um, you know, an, if you were having like an overly extracted um, <laughs> California white wine, it may be this color. But yeah, so it's it's got that like red red tint to it. Yeah, so that's just from it sitting exclusively in that cask. Um, <clears throat> to touch on what Gareth said about the the port cask, I think specifically with this cocktail, having the berry notes in there, you're gonna get the port is really gonna come out a lot with those berry notes that are already in the syrup. So any port whiskey that you use is gonna be great in this cocktail in general. It's it's really gonna draw out a lot of those those berry notes that are in the port because port has a lot of that like ripe red fruit note to it a little bit of like a sweeter style whereas like a, a cabernet sauvignon cask would be a little bit drier on the red fruit end so like an unripened strawberry um like a more tart sort of note like a cranberry or something so i think i think a pork finished whiskey is kind of ideal for this for this cocktail specifically um and i don't think that necessarily the the mash bill of the whiskey is going to make a huge difference at the end of the day for it Got you. It'll um, add a little bit of nuance to it, but it's not going to like completely turn it in one direction that you won't like anymore. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and you, sorry, it's something that I just learned. It's the the um, single barrel is the one that has all the those four finishes on it. That's the uh, that's single malt. Oh, that's the single malt. Okay. Yeah. So the single barrels are ones that are are specialty like LT like limited time. Yeah. Items. So uh, total wine has a single barrel right now or single cask that we released uh, a couple of years ago and some of them still have it. And that one is exclusively aged in, um, uh, what is it? I sold, I sold out of it here, so I can't remember now. I'm not sampling it anymore. 
I'm, um, I'm, I'm shouting out Madeira because that's my personal favorite and you don't see it done very often or they do it very limited time and then it's gone. It's a but... PX sherry cask is what it is. Okay. Just yeah. personal thing. So it's, yeah. It's like, it's 55%, um, very strong with the raisin flavor, kind of a, a unique whiskey in general, but. Interesting. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. And that's only in the, it's only in like Massachusetts or that's all over total? No, that was released to total wines across the country. Okay. Not cool. every store got the allocation, but, um, but yeah, if you're ever looking for a fun uh, cast strength tealing, that's, that's the one I would look for. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and then Nick, in terms of how Angels Envy got to doing this, um, you know, doing the standard bourbon with the port finish, do you know if, if, was it, there something from Lincoln Henderson's, you know, previous work that maybe like led him to doing that style when he started his own brand? Yeah, so Lincoln, super interesting figure. Um, he'd been in the bourbon industry. Uh, he passed away a few years ago, but he was in the bourbon industry for 39 years, which is incredible. Um, he was one of the first inductees in the Bourbon Hall of Fame. Um, so he has a long lineage of working in the, in the industry. Um, but yeah, he worked for a few different brands. Um, he helped create Jack Daniel's single barrel, and then he worked in developed Woodford Reserve. Um, but he also worked with some Japanese whiskey, uh, Jim Dean Suntory, and then Scotch Glimmerangy, where he saw a lot of these different uh, finishing barrel techniques. Uh, mind you, in Scotland, you can use different barrels, whereas bourbon, you have to use the new charred oak barrel initially. Um, so I think he wanted to do this kind of finishing thing in the bourbon world before it was kind of everywhere. Um, so when we broke out on the market in 2010, 2011, we were one of the first like flagship um, SKUs was a port finish um, in a secondary maturation. So it's still going to be that bourbon barrel for four to six years until we get that um, flavor profile we're looking for. And then it's aged in a secondary cask, that port cask for uh, two to four months. Um, and obviously, you know, it could be a little bit shorter, a little bit longer, but it's really to get that flavor profile. Um, and just to back up what the other two said, um, it's super nuanced, it's super subtle. It's not in your face port, um, which I really like because when you, you know, when you buy a bourbon, you want it to taste like bourbon. You want to kind of have those, a whisper of that finishing, not like a, a smack in the face kind of, flavor profile, um, but also to what Matt said, once you start pairing that in cocktails or with other fortified wines, that's when you see those notes kind of explode and um, really amplify, which is really special. That's awesome. It, it's, it's interesting because Glenn Morangy is, is, probably the, is probably the producer that made me love Madeira cask finish. And they did it um, very early on in like my career of you know, bartending and pouring that spirit for people. And then it sort of vanished for a long time. So anytime I see Dr. Bill, or I'm, I'm always asking like, when are you guys going to do it again? Because it's so, it's really interesting. It's so different than, than many of the others. Um, even, even the port, which a lot of people throw sort of together with Madeira. Um, and then also a, a comment to Matt, uh, Sandra said that she has the, um, she has the single grain. She said the, the, the Cabernet cask, um, her friend brought it back from Ireland, but it's also at their local Total Wine, and she loves it straight and using it in the Dublin After Dark, which is the cocktail that it was intended for in the first place. Well, that the the uh, small batch was intended for, but uh, you know, as I was saying, like I made mine with uh, with the single grain as well, and it's really fun. It came out extremely well. Gareth, I would love if you would talk a little bit about. Um, I think everybody knows doers, but we have a couple minutes to learn about what Aberfeldy is, where it came from, how long it's been around, and um, basically who's in, in charge of making it the spirit it is, which is what I have in this glass right here. Very good. <clears throat> I've got some here as well, so in good yeah. company, my friend. Um, no, I'd love we could, to. We could, by the way, we can do a mid-happy hour uh, cheers right here. We can, we can absolutely do that. So there we go. I'm going to clink that on there. Enjoy. Okay, there you go. Sorry, continue. Thanks. So look, Aberfeldy, it's been around since 1898. <clears throat> it was built by two gentlemen, uh, John Alexander and Tommy Dewar, who were two sons of John Dewar of the John Dewar's blended Scotch empire, which was founded around about 1846. 
But Aberfeldy isn't just the name of the distillery that I get to represent. It's the name of a town that exists. It sits on the banks of the River Tay, which is the longest freshwater river that runs through Scotland. But it sits in a part of Scotland that's called Perthshire, which effectively is, is the gateway to the Highlands. This distillery is probably one of the most beautiful distilleries that exists within the Scottish Isles. Um, it's just surrounded by rolling lush hills and vegetation, but it really is the, the gateway to the Highlands, making Aberfeldy a Highland whiskey. But most importantly, we are 100% non, we use 100% non-peated barley in our production methodology, which means that we're an incredibly approachable single malt scotch. Um, <clears throat> Now, the distillery itself, or when we talk about Aberfeldy whiskey, there's a few things that we're known for specifically. Now, you're going to have to bear with me on this, right? Because at first, it sounds like a stretch. But when I explain the reasoning why, it's going to make, well, it's just going to become a lot clearer. So if you were to talk to people about our whiskey who know our whiskey, and in the grander scheme, in the grander scheme of things in America, we're actually relatively young. We've only been around for around about six years. So we're still one of the more esoteric single malt scotches that exist. But we're known as the Golden Dram, and that's for a very specific reason. The water source that the distillery pulls from for its production water is called the Pathili Burn, and it contains deposits of alluvial gold. Now, if you were to talk to people about our whiskey as well, one of the things that we're probably better known for is these beautiful, rare, honeyed notes that exist within each and every mark of whiskey that we produce. Now, Pay attention because we're going to have a really cool little gift that Don is going to do a quiz for later. Now, we're talking about the Aberfeldy 12 for this particular box, but within our core lineup, we also have a 16-year-old that's finished in Olorosa Sherry and a 21-year-old. And if you're lucky enough to be able to find it, as we were talking about finishing earlier, we have at the moment a limited release 18-year-old that's been finished in Cote Roti French red wine casks which to be honest is absolutely stunning and was, was put together by Stephanie McLeod, who's our master of malts, but I'm gonna get back to her in, in just a second. So these rare honey notes, it's kind of our house style, it's what we're known for. It's one of the reasons that our whiskey is approachable as it is, but that's because of two very specific, well, two very specific things that we apply within our production methodology. First of all, we have what we call a patient or extended fermentation time, which is a minimum of 72 hours long. And to put that into context, when you look at the world of Scotch whiskey, the average fermentation time is around about 55 to 60 hours. So it's that extended time that really allows the creation of those honeyed flavor profiles that you find within Aberfeldy. The other reason is, is we have these incredibly eloquent and beautiful stills that create a huge amount of copper contact during distillation. Now that copper contact really allows us to produce this beautiful light, floral and approachable spirit. Now I mentioned her earlier, Stephanie McLeod. Donnie, you gotta give me a second because this lady is absolutely incredible and I'd be remiss if I didn't tell these people how special she was. Right, master blender for doers, master of malts, for the single malts that exist within the doer's portfolio. Now, this box, we're talking about Aberfeldy, but we've also got Altmore, Craig Elke, the Devron, and Royal Brackler. So one of the world's largest blending houses, five single malt distilleries. This lady is responsible for not only all the production, but the blending of all the whiskies that come out of JDS, which is John, Dewar, and Sons. <clears throat> 2018, she was awarded by the Icons of Whiskey Award, based in Europe, Master Blender of the Year, 2019 IWC International Whiskey Competition. Without a doubt, the most prestigious competition that exists within the global world of whiskey, the first female to ever be awarded Master Blender of the Year. She then won that again in 2020, and then she went on and won it again in 2021, making her the first ever Master Blender to win that award three times in a row. So she is the reason that we're talking about this 12 year old whiskey. She is the reason that you guys hopefully are gonna go out, grab a bottle and try it in the cocktails. That being said, Nick, that recipe, I can't wait to try that. I actually had my box turn up earlier on today. So I've got the ingredients and I've always been a massive fan of Angel's Envy. In fact, we got taken out there on a ramble a few years ago and I'm really close friends with the guys who represent Angel's Envy in New York as well, so really excited. And Matt, you know how much I love teeling. But look, I'm gonna stop rambling about Aberfeldy. 
But go out, <laughs> grab a bottle, try it neat, and then try it with these cocktails. Because I guarantee you, it's going to be amazing. Um, and there's, uh, you know what I found today? Actually, I found the little um, hot, like the hot cup that comes with the Aberfeldy spice blend, which is super cool. It's basically, it's, it's like a, essentially like a tea bag. Um, and then like a little Aberfeldy 12 mini. And then it comes with, you know, a paper cup with a, a wrapper of an Aberfeldy wrap around where you, it gives you instructions on how to brew the tea. It's essentially like a tiny little, you know, hot toddy cup. It's really fun, but obviously the shaker and spoon cocktails are going to be far more fun and complex and different, but that's kind of, that's kind of the great thing is like, you can make that cocktail, but you can make, um, you know, the rough diamond cocktail with all three spirits and see how they differ. And then, and we, we've usually found where, cause this is the first time we've done three different spirits and completely different categories. And what we've found is that people will try with each one. And then once they pick their favorite, they'll go back and make their fourth one, which whatever their favorite was with the first three, which is kind of cool. Um, thank you for the thing, I, you know, she, people who are in the business obviously know um, Stephanie, but she is, is really, the, the amount of work that's on her plate is really incredible considering how well all these products come out at the end as well. Like, she, she, I don't know how she, honestly, I have no idea how she does it. It's really impressive. Um, on, a, on a similar note, we, we talked a little bit about the small batch teeling, which is, again, that was the recommendation that came for these cocktails. And we talked a little bit about the, about the single barrel and the, um, and the single malt. But can you tell us a little bit more, Matt, about, because the teeling family has a really interesting history within the former, um, you know, formerly, you know, beam distilleries. And they were one of only three brands that were able to like separate when beam came in and purchased a lot of Irish whiskey distilleries. So it hasn't been around for a long time, but the, the provenance of this particular family has. Yeah. So, um, a little history about Irish whiskey in general is, um, Dublin at one point was the epicenter for world whiskey be it Scotch, Irish, literally all whiskeys in the world. Um, and when the rise of blended Scotch happened, prohibition in the United States, the Irish temperance movement, all of these things kind of lined up to make Irish whiskey no longer a sustainable business. So we went from having 40 plus uh, distilleries on the island to down to about three. Um, and one of them wasn't even used anymore. It was basically just storage. Um, and that's actually Bushmills, which is interesting because they're the oldest distillery on the island. Um, but fast forward a few years, um, and the, the Teeling family got into distillation in Dublin back then with Walter Teeling. Uh, he had a distillery actually right down the road from where our distillery is right now in the Liberties. Um, and that was in 1782. So now fast forward to now. And the Teeling family has opened another distillery, Jack and Stephen Teeling. Um, they started the company in 2012. They opened the distillery in 2015. And that's right in the Liberties, uh, center of Dublin, basically. Um, and the whole point of us opening the distillery so close to their family's old distillery is basically because we wanted to bring whiskey back, whiskey making back to Dublin. And there was no distilleries in Dublin for 125 years before we built ours. Since which, is, built, which is which is crazy considering yeah. the fact that it's it's like the heart of Irish whiskey. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's crazy to think about it too, because Jameson has their non-functioning distillery still in Dublin in this in the city. Um, and that's turned into it's just their their um warehouse and well not their warehouse, but their you, it's a tasting it's like room a, though. Yeah, it's a tasting room and yeah. tours. And I've heard rumors that they do small batch distillation there just to make sure that the equipment still works and everything, but they don't actually sell any of that whiskey really. Um, so it's kind of cool that we we came back in 2015 and opened the first distillery to open in Dublin in 125 years. Um, so now fast forward to now, we have over 350 awards for our distillery and our whiskeys, one of which was we won world's best single malts in 2019 for our 24 year. Um, and that whiskey was a slightly peated um, single malt aged in ex-bourbon and then finished in sauterne casks. 
And that was the first time an Irish whiskey's ever won that award, which wow. is huge. Um, so basically the, the whole thing with us is innovation in general. And that's why I kept talking about our, our different cask types. And it's actually great that everybody on this call works with an innovative company in general, because Aberfeldy does stuff, does great stuff with their innovation, um, especially their 18 year. There was a two years ago, I think that there was two different innovations that they came out with. And I have both of them sitting here waiting for me to open them for a special occasion. Um, I'm a big, I'm a big family supporter. So I, I always, you know, I always buy the new innovations that any Bacardi products are putting out basically, but it's, uh, it's, those scotches are phenomenal and, uh, innovation is just, it's like a great way to, to kind of gauge how a business is doing, especially in the whiskey realm, where if you're, if you're not innovating very much, then I think that you're trying to get your legs under you. And once you start innovating, that's when you kind of see the, the master blenders and distillers like show their show their true colors, you know, they want to like really express what they're doing in the world. Um, and Teeling has done a lot of innovation and that's that's kind of our goal in general. So we have five whiskeys total now. Um, three of them are our core line. Two of them are still working towards that, that core uh, status. But we have our small batch, which is the blended whiskey aged in ex bourbon barrels and finished in rum casks for about a year. That's the one that was suggested for you guys to use today. Um, we have our single grain, which we touched on, that's aged exclusively in Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon barrels. Um, we have our single malt, which is aged full maturation in Oloroso sherry casks, and then it's finished in Port Madeira Cabernet Sauvignon and White Burgundy. And that one is really fun, it's very complex. Um, and again, we were trying to focus on innovation and, and nobody wants to compete with any Scotch brand when it comes to single malts in general, because, you know, Scotland is the, is the land of single malts. So trying to go kind of away from focusing on the, the malt itself and more focusing on, on the barrels that we were using. And we also have a single pot still, and that released in 2019. That's aged in, uh, ex bourbon barrels, virgin American oak, and then it's finished in Oloroso sherry casks. Yeah. And uh, single pot still is kind of interesting, actually. It's a blend of malted and unmalted barley. So you get this really nice kind of spice to it from the unmalted barley. And uh, it can only be made in Ireland, which is cool. It's, it's uh, basically, it came out of necessity of trying to avoid paying more tax to England than, was, than we wanted to, essentially. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> England was like, we're going to start taxing your malted barley. And they were like, okay. So we're just going to dump in unmalted barley. So how's that sound? <laughs> it's not Gareth's fault, even though I heard that some guy named Howell came up with that lot. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, and then we just released another whiskey, which is our peated single malt. And that whiskey is aged in ex bourbon barrels and finished in sauterne casks. So I call it like our baby 24 year. Um, so we basically were trying to keep that that tradition going with the Sauterne cask. And I don't, if you don't know what Sauterne cask is, uh, it's a French dessert wine where they actually let the grape start fermenting on the vine essentially. And when it, the outer shell hardens and when they crack it, just liquid kind of pours out. And it's this really delicious, like syrupy, fruity, amazing dessert wine. It's usually fairly expensive. If you're in a restaurant, you'll see they'll sell like small bottles of it and it's, it's kind of pricey, but um, it's worth, it's worth a try. It's a very cool dessert wine in general. Um, but it really lends itself to the whiskey with the peat. It, it pulls out a lot of that, like nice fruitiness that you get from some of the peated whiskeys in general. Yeah. Glenn Morangy's Nectar d'Or, you know, going back to that particular brand is, is possibly the one that continuously like shows off how well Sauterne can do with whiskey in general, much less a pretty brilliant single malt. Um, but even though I think it's their priciest one, it's still not my, like my favorite is still the Madeira that they've ever made. But I can also get the Nectar on a regular basis and I can't get the Madeira. So it is what it is. Um, can, you, can you tell folks um, really briefly, we have like another minute on this about the, um, the Teeling Black Pits. Cause I tried that when it was released and it's super different and it's, it's kind of an interesting story. Yeah, so the Black Pits, that is the one that I was just talking about, the peated whiskey, um, aged in ex bourbon and finished in Sauterne casks. So oh, Black I didn't realize that. The Black Pits is finished in Sauterne? Okay, yeah, I didn't, yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah, so um, it's funny because we released that whiskey, um, I think it was probably the year after um, Aberfeldy released a Sauterne cask whiskey, or maybe we released it at the same time. I can't remember how that lined up. I 
think I probably still was working on Abercrombie at the time. And, you know, it, the, the last few years, I think I've lost all my brain cells. So anyways, um, <laughs> the Black Pits, it's, it's interesting because we, the whole focus is trying to keep it to, yeah, that's the bottle. That's one of the ones that I haven't opened because I had, a, I still have a little sample bottle of it. By the um, way, when you said you've lost, you know, that you've lost all your brain cells, I saw a bunch of people nodding like this. I've lost all my brain cells in the past two years. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think it's, I think, unfortunately, it's a, uh, it's a uh, part of the pandemic. Um, so, so yeah, the Black Pits, we, so like I said, we have a big focus on Dublin in general and the Teeling family has always been in Dublin. That's where they're from. That's where they, they hold their roots. So when we came out with Black Pits, they also wanted to keep that Dublin centric. So uh, Black Pits was part of the liberties where the leather workers were and the blacksmiths were. Um, so it was kind of like this smoky, um, fiery area. So they wanted to, they really took that and they wanted to make sure that they incorporated it into the, into the whiskey itself. So that's why it's called Black Pits. Um, and again, it, it has that like nice kind of peat. It's only 15 parts per million peat. So it's nothing crazy. It's not going to be like a Lafroy or Lagavulin. Um, and it, the Sautern really kicks in at the finish with a little bit of sweetness and fruitiness. They kind of it, it marries everything together. It's a beautiful whiskey in general. It's really interesting. If you guys ever see it at a store, it's definitely worth it. It's it's a it's a little bit more, if I recall, than um, than some of the the core line. It's just I found it to be like one of the more like interesting innovations in a while. So yeah, it, I'd say it usually comes in at about seventy seventy to seventy five dollars a bottle. Um, and then it also just won number three best whiskey in the world, according to Whiskey Advocate magazine, too. So you guys are all up, all up in the awards right now. It's a good, it's a good year for awards. I feel like yeah. for for a lot of whiskey companies, especially people that are doing innovation stuff, it's been fun. So really quick question: um, If you guys can each tell me one thing that has happened in your market. Because one of one of the sections that we always do in our happy hours is what we call this um, the status of the hospitality industry. It's kind of like our mini state of the union, like what's happening. And it doesn't matter if we do the happy hour every month or if we did it every other day. I feel like the news changes that quickly. If each of you has um, an example of some of one cool positive thing that has happened in your market um, recently, like. Uh, a bar that has done some interesting innovation to to be successful during this time, et cetera. Um, I'm going to give you each like, um, you know, one or two sentences so that we can um, dive into trivia. Nick, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, well, I am from Florida, which you guys may know. It's the wild, wild west, uh, but on the southeast. So, um, you know, somewhat fortunate that we haven't had many restrictions in terms of how that's affected the hospitality industry. Um, I do not professionally bartend. I haven't in about two years, but my girlfriend is a bar manager. Um, so yeah, the first couple of months of the pandemic were pretty hard, but um, fortunately they've been able to be open. Um, whereas I know some other states have had uh, stricter restrictions, um, which has in inversely affected their business. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, we're fortunate in that sense, um, to be able to operate. So, you know, a lot of our places did survive luckily and, uh, obviously the holidays helped. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, to be able to have outdoor for a larger section of the year makes a big difference. I mean, for sure um, for, for Tampa repeal day in, um, like just across the bridge, there's that whole strip of places that are set up for just really amazing outdoor dining and i feel like you know rooftop or front yard or side yard they're really fortunate to be able to do that and still allow people to be at whatever level of comfort they needed to be yeah that, that, that's a good point her you know specifically my girlfriend's bar it's a lot of outdoor capacity so you know they weren't affected like some of the other bars were and they also serve food so you know, it just kind of depends on, uh, you know, which bar or restaurant kind of their setup. But overall, I think we're, we're fortunate. Um, it's, it's just an interesting time to be navigating, I guess. It's an interesting time to be alive. To put it um, lightly. Matt, any, any great examples from your market of, of something cool somebody's done, like as an innovation? Yeah, so um, 
like I said, because I keep complaining about the weather up here, uh, I'm from the Northeast. Um, I've been, I've spent almost my entire life here, other than when I was in the military. Um, and so growing up here, it's very hard to be outdoors dining in the fall and winter. I mean, late fall into winter and then early spring, it starts raining. So you still don't really want to be outside. So we, there's actually um, the timeout market here came up with this brilliant idea to work with REI to put in a, um, a skate rink and then they built a outdoor bar in like a it's like a trail a truck like a food truck basically and they parked it right next to the skating rink so people can kind of come off the skating rink go over to the outdoor bar order their cocktails and then sit under these heaters um in this like outdoor area and i was lucky enough that teeling was involved uh Am angels envy is also involved um and we we serve hot cocktails only and they have like small snacks out there um and then if people want to go indoors they can always go indoors to the to the timeout market which is basically a food um uh what do you call them food hall food hall there we go that's the word i'm looking for <laughs> told you brain cells gone 86. um <laughs> So yeah, the, that's kind of like the most innovative thing I think that I've seen, especially this season, is coming up with the idea of like having people outdoors already doing an activity and then having the bar, um, the bar available for people as soon as they get off the skating rink. That's so actually I, super clever. That's yeah. really clever. And it's, it's cool too, because they work with small businesses to basically have in their food hall already. So it's benefiting small businesses too, because it's drawing people out to the skating rink and then people go in and they try the food at these vendors. And then they're like, oh, I really want to go to this sit down restaurant now and try that restaurant. Um, so the whole thing has been, it's been kind of an awesome thing to watch. I've basically been spending like every weekend there doing samplings just to make sure that we were, uh, we're keeping up with, with the demand for the outdoor dining and stuff. So, um, That's great. so yeah, it's been, it's been really cool to watch that whole thing happen and, um, I think that's probably the most innovative thing that I've seen other than to go cocktails, which are, are like hit or miss right now, depending on who's doing them. And, you know, um, but I saw and depending, on, and depending on the state also, because some of the state laws have, have foolishly changed back to, yeah. you know, pre pandemic. So we'll, we'll Absolutely. see how that goes, but the, yeah, the ice skating ring thing is such a great idea. I wish I saw, we saw more of that. Yeah. I thought it was, I thought it was a great idea. They were talking about maybe in the future doing it across the country. So um, hopefully if it does well this year, then, then we'll see it roll out across the country at other timeout markets as well. Uh, obviously in Miami where they have one, I don't think a skating rink is necessarily going to work very well, but you know, maybe a swimming pool or something. I don't know. Um. <laughs> It'll last for an afternoon. The, yeah. Like the, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and then Gareth, how about you? And it doesn't have to be like in New York, if you have been in other markets and you've seen something that really stood out as a great innovation to blast through this time. I mean, this does apply to New York, but I know that this applies to other markets as well. Now, granted, work for a liquor company, so it might be marginally controversial. However, I think everyone knows the toll that COVID and just life in general has had on many people. And, um, you know, I guess kind of drinking alcohol can be quite, uh, can pay quite a heavy toll, especially if you work within the industry. With everything that's happening and with January being one of the slowest months, I think one of the trends that I've seen that I've, I've really been quite enthused about is a lot of people do the, the dry January, right? You give up booze for the month of January. Now, if you're a bartender and you're working, that's not necessarily the best thing because you kind of want those people within the bars. And what's really been happening is a lot of people have been adopting low and no ABV cocktail programs which people have wholeheartedly been supporting. So it allows you to kind of maintain that dry January status, but still have the ability to go out, sit at a bar, support the local businesses and bartenders that you want to be able to support. And I think that's been a very massively encouraging thing. It's been quite poignant in New York. I know I've seen it around other markets as well. And of course, with New York, talking about to-go cocktails, New York just ratified to-go cocktails as well for the foreseeable future, which is a great thing for bars and bartenders as well. But I just generally think that the community supporting the community has been one of the most positive aspects that I've been seeing in and around this. And I can't imagine it's going to be going away anytime soon. Yeah, I mean, it's it's good that people are, are, are planning for the long run because again, if some of these, um, if some of the laws, especially about to-go cocktails, are just extended forever. I don't think it's going to take business away from any 
from everywhere else. I think it's actually going to do really great things for both on and off premise. But um, and and quite frankly, for the for the for the guests, like for our guests. Um, and by the way, speaking of like um, being enthusiastic and, and supportive, Laurie Evans really loves your accent. I just want to let you know. <laughs> I chat. just saw that, Laurie. Thank okay. you very much. <laughs> um, so what we're going to do now for for uh, you know for the folks who have been um, paying attention and um, really enjoying this happy hour is we have a bunch of really cool trivia prizes. If for those of you who have never joined us before for the happy hour or to re remind you because it's 2022 and we've lost all of our brain cells, um, the way it's going to, Nick is going to ask the question and he's going to put it out there um, in terms of, his is actually like a, a four part answer but the first person to actually put all of the correct answers in one post in the chat is going to be the person that wins the wins the prize. But um, second, okay, perfect, great. Are you ready? You'll do uh, question number two. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so again, put this in the chat if you have. By the way, Trisha already jumped on it and she like included what was on your shirt, which is why I changed That's, it up. But yeah. Trisha, that was, I mean. <laughs> It's a pretty, it's a pretty good attempt. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Nick. All right. So earlier, kind of when I was talking about the history of the brand and um, Lincoln Henderson, I mentioned a couple of distilleries that he had worked for in the past. Um, so I guess we need all four, which that's pretty tough. So it's tough, yeah. but the, but knowing, knowing Angel. So, so ironically, the woman who's the national brand ambassador for Angel's Envy, her name is actually Angel. So, um, <laughs> She will most she will undoubtedly have a very cool prize for you. So I feel like people should work for it. So we'll see how it goes. If you can if you can name all four distilleries that he worked for before starting Angels Envy, then go for it. Just post it into the chat. We'll see if anybody was listening. They might be Google on this one. <laughs> they might be. We'll <laughs> see. We'll see if it comes up. I'd be impressed if someone got three out of four, but I was, you know, usually like all of a sudden the chat will start going crazy and there'll be a bunch <laughs> of people here. I am, I am shocked, Shaker and Spooners, right now that you guys are not really on top of this. <laughs> I think you, I think it was mentioned so subtly that they missed out. So uh, we're going to give them a minute to come, to come back to that. Um, in the meantime, while, while people are doing their, their Googles, um, oh, I see the whistle pig introduced the new non-alcoholic whiskey. I would love to get your, your opinion, um, from each of you on like one of your favorite, uh, NA spirits right now. Uh, Matt, you had, you had mentioned liars, but is there a specific one? Um, I just, I thought it was interesting that they did that huge line um they have like a million options now and i have some friends that work for them now and it's it's kind of exciting to see what they're doing i just love that people are in that space in general other than just seed lip um because i think that seed lip kind of realized that there was a niche market for that and then took off with it and everybody else was kind of left in the dust and now people are starting to catch up i'm actually really excited about um there's two martini and rossi non-alcoholic vermouths coming out um, and I think they released overseas, but I don't, I don't know when they're going to be stateside yet, but, um, those are going to be pretty exciting. Cause I'm more of a, I'm more of a like long drink guy, if I'm not going to have any alcohol in my cocktail. So having like a vermouth and soda or something like that, it's kind of exciting for me. So, yeah, I don't know anyone that's nailed the vermouth yet. So I'd be super curious to try that. Yeah. That's, that's something I'm definitely looking forward to. Um, the Liars Italian Orange is the one that I find myself recommending to people the most because they nailed it. It's essentially, they, sorry, Campari. I mean, it's not Campari, but like they did a great job with that bittersweet where you still get that bite and you feel like it could potentially have the alcohol in, but they did really well with it. Um, okay, for those of you who are posting, um, anything that is Jack Daniels related is Brown Foreman. So Woodford, Gentleman, Jack, Jack Daniels, and Brown Foreman, Trisha, is all one distillery. So... That is not, uh, yeah, just to let you know. But we got a couple people who started like posting some stuff. Andrew Connor Spencer, <laughs> Google is failing you. Yes, Google is failing you. So 
I, I right. do have the answers and I am open to bribes. I'm not sure <laughs> it's gonna work, but uh, if anyone wants to hit me up, feel free. Highest, highest bit of wins. What's your, what's your Venmo? You got to tell them your Venmo. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're like, and I need it to be executed and in my account before it continues. Um, all right. Well, let's, and, and one that has not been mentioned yet was one that we brought up multiple times because of how good they are as a distillery of doing finishes. We literally mentioned them like four other times within the happy hour. So I'm going to leave that one for a second. Uh, I don't know as well. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, okay. We may, at, at this point, oh. we may have to default back to Trisha for just like, you know, remembering the, remembering the, uh, the mash bill, which, hey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Let's, let's move on. Let's go to Matt and Matt. I think that you should do, um, uh, a two parter of number one and number three. Oh, okay. Um, what year was the Teeling Distillery built, and how long had it been since another distillery was built in Dublin? I know. See, that's why I threw out a bunch of dates. I was like, "Yeah, let's throw them off." Yeah, I thought <laughs> I, when you were when you were talking about, it, I was like, "Ooh, that's really good. That's sneaky." <laughs> Okay, well, you're, you're, uh, oh, boom, nailed it. Holly got it. Okay, great. Holly got it. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. So, so the Teeling, Dist the, the Teeling Distillery was built in 2015 in Dublin. Um, and it had been 125 years since a distillery had been built in Dublin. So, um, she nailed it. So, Holly, do, do us a favor and please, um, in your chat, change your chat to Shaker and Spoon host and send a private chat and include the email address that you use for your Shaker and Spoon account. That way we can communicate with you and get you your prize. And um, Matt's prize is very, very cool. Uh, he's doing a bottle of single malt and some glasses and some whiskey stones, which is pretty sweet. So that's, that's gonna be a great one. Um, okay, Gareth, I think you should ask, hold on, where's yours? Um, I think you should uh, do a two-parter as number one and number two. Number one and number two. Okay, yes. in, in, in what year was the Aberfeldy Distillery founded? And who is Aberfeldy's master of malts? So again, in what year was the distillery founded and who is our master of malts? Also known as master blender. Interchangeable terms, but it is the same person. It's really funny because you also in your during your um, your spiels gave out a couple of dates. <laughs> I think till till he threw people off. Okay. Um, you got a couple of people who uh, you got a couple of people. We need we need full name and correct year. So we've got like a couple of hodgepodgey things here, and we it has to be exact. Everyone's really, everyone's close on some stuff. That one in the future was my favorite. Who's got the fastest yeah. fingers? <laughs> All the information's there. Who has the fastest fingers? Yeah. Okay. There Jen go. got it. Boom. Well done. Jen, congratulations. Okay, Jen, remember to, uh, to send a private message to the Shaker and Spoon handle on this chat and give the email address that you use um, for your Shaker and Spoon um, subscription. We still have Nick's question, which um, really, I guess I, we could, I guess we can get three out of four at this point because we really want somebody to win the prize. <laughs> but three out of the four of the um, products that the Angels Envy Master Distiller Lincoln Henderson previously worked for, whether to create single, like a very specific product or worked at that distillery for a while. That part doesn't matter. We were interested in the four places or the four products that he worked on before creating Angel's Envy. I guess this is way tougher because usually it's like- This was not on Google. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's not on Google. And for the most part, if, if there's a date involved, like 
people definitely like jump on dates to like, yeah. oh, 1898. I'm going to remember that one. But um, I feel totally, I feel totally fine. Um, uh, you know, it was, it was a preemptive strike, but I feel pretty good about um, giving it to Trisha because nobody got it. And she jumped right in with the mash bill. And yeah, we're, it's still, it's still off. So let's, let's go, go with, let's go with Trisha. You, you really nailed it on that one, which I thought was pretty funny. Um, and Sarah, you're, you're close, but again, Brown, Brown Foreman is the distillery, but the products were Jack Daniels Woodford. And then he did a Japanese whiskey for Beam Centauri and also Glenmorangie. And Glenmorangie is the one that we mentioned multiple times because they're so well known for doing their, for doing like cool finishes. But um, there'll be other opportunities, Sarah, uh, you know, come back again next month and, and we'll have some great prizes for you. Um, Guys, thank you so much for, for your time. I know that everyone stuck with us a little bit long today. We just got into a great discussion about all these whiskeys. I'm excited for, for, for all of you that are going to have your boxes showing up. For those of you that already have them, hope you're already enjoying them, that you're playing around with the various whiskeys. And uh, if you guys have any questions, um, you know, follow up with any of these guys. If you scroll all the way up to the top of the chat, You'll, I put their um, their Instagram handle so you can message them if you have questions. And and cheers to everybody. Here's to a really strong 2022 filled with love, life, and the water of life. So thank you guys so much for joining. Thank you. Cheers, y'all. Thank you, everyone.